it will probably come as no surprise to all of you uh, that I am a giant nerd. Um, you probably should have picked up on that at this point with the like monthly Lord of the Rings references. Um, but when I was growing up, I really enjoyed the science fiction writing of Robert Heinlein. Uh, and one of my favorite books of his was called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. It was about a fictional future where the moon, uh, which had originally been used as a penal colony for Earth's worst criminals, had developed its own society. But it was deeply dependent upon Earth for many supplies used to survive. In the novel, Heinlein developed a saying that described the economic balance between his fictional Earth and the moon that has, in the years since, become a common way of describing one of the basic rules of a market economy. And that is, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Or, if you really like acronyms, TANSTAFUL. Um, <laughs> It's not a great acronym. But basically, the idea is, in a scarcity-based economy, uh, nothing is truly free. Everything costs someone something. Uh, indeed, this idea, I think, stretches out of economics and has some pretty solid effects on our lives today in the culture that we live in. I think it affects the way that we look, about, look at the fundamental meaning of life. Can my life really be about things whose value is not measurable? It changes the way we look at the value of a human being. Do I have inherent value, or is my value based upon my usefulness to the people around me? In our passage today, I think God really challenges this view of value in life. In fact, I believe that today God is going to convince us that the only things in life that can really satisfy don't have a price tag because we would never be able to pay it. I believe that God is going to challenge our ideas of what we need in life, where we should be looking for it, and how we should get it. So let's go ahead and dive into Isaiah 55. We're going to start by reading verses 1 through 5. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make it with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that, you did, not, that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank you for this word from you and, and the other words that we will read after it. We pray uh, that it would not return to you void, but that it would accomplish the purpose that you have set before it this morning in our hearts and in our minds. We pray it in your name. Amen. I, I think the first thing we are challenged on here in verses 1 through 5 is the idea of finding what we're looking for. Uh, where is it that we find what we're looking for? As we open the passage, we find God challenging the Israelites' ideas about where to find the things they need in life. There's something deeply poetic about that opening in the passage where it talks about buying without money, drinking when we're thirsty without worrying about the price. The, the Israelites seem to have been like many of us and like most people throughout his human history where they're preoccupied with acquiring the things that they need in life, the, the physical requirements. They need water, they need food, and while sure, there's a much deeper metaphorical side that we're about to start rolling into, we don't want to skip over the fact that they had needs. They, they needed the physical provisions of life. And God doesn't deny the Israelites, or us, uh, their needs. Physical, spiritual, emotional. He doesn't say, hey, just, just go hungry and it'll be okay. Or just keep working without rest and you'll magically stop being tired. How many of us try to do that? What he does is he challenges the Israelites' way of thinking about how it is that they're supposed to acquire these things that they need. 
the Israelites were operating in a tangible mindset. They, they were operating the idea that they needed to earn and work, and often, as we look throughout their history, scheme and deceive and cheat to acquire the things that they needed in life. Both physically, yes, but also in more subtle ways as well. We see them seeking after spiritual blessings, emotional fulfillment, relational wholeness. The letter is written, the, 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 the letter of Isaiah is written with a post-exilic audience in mind. An audience who were saying, we messed up, we got exiled, and we are never going to let that happen again. This is where we get the popularity in the years between the end of the age of the prophets and Jesus' day of uh, groups like the Pharisees, who in the time leading up to Jesus' birth kind of gather around and say, we will earn our way into no more exiles. We will follow the rules so well that it will compel God to be faithful and merciful to us because of our great obedience. And there are still plenty of us who try to do this today. This is the mindset, the mentality that we see in the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son who goes to his father and says, Father, I've done everything you ask, and now you owe it to me to do what I'm asking. The Israelites are working and working and working for their needs, and that's where the irony of these first few verses comes in. Because they're told by God, hey, go and buy and eat. And they're working and they're working. And I think they're realizing, as we read other passages in Isaiah, they're realizing that their work won't get it for them. That they don't have the money that they need for the food, for the things that they need to acquire. And yet, God says, no, you are able to come and purchase without money. He's saying, your, work, your, your money is not good here. Your work cannot purchase it for you, but I will provide a way for you to get what you need. And there's even better news. Because I don't know about you, but when I think about receiving things without price, when I think about receiving my needs without having to give something up for it, uh, at least in my experience, the thing I'm receiving back is probably close to worthless. Um, back in the opening days of the pandemic, the food, uh, the food pantry in the small community that I was serving at the time went from serving about 20 to 40 families once a month to serving 200 plus families every week. The, the demand skyrocketed, the needs skyrocketed, and so a lot of us dove in to help in various ways. But over that first month, I quickly realized that what was really going to be the extra uh, source of work was helping the people who were receiving it to not feel worthless because the things they were getting were worthless. We were getting donations of rotting fruit and expired canned goods and stuff that other people just didn't want for one reason or another because because it wasn't any good. And we had to add a whole extra step to our process to root out the worthless stuff that we were getting in. That's what I think about when I think about I'm receiving for free. I'm getting the things. It's that I get the bottom of the barrel or I get the bare minimum. But here, God says, here, don't just receive uh, water and bread. Receive wine and milk. They were symbols for richness and enjoyment. It's saying God isn't interested in just giving you your bare needs. God wants you to have joy and fullness and goodness in your life. When verse 2 questions, why do you spend, it says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Why do you spend your labor for that which does not satisfy? We're continuing that spiritual metaphor. The Israelites are taking what they have, their, their work, their time, their lives. They're putting all of it into trying to get the things that they need, but they're targeting the wrong things. He says, you're targeting things that don't have eternal worth. All the while, the one thing that does have eternal worth is sitting right here in front of you, priceless and able to be bought with no price that you have to pay, and yet your tendency is to ignore it, to chase after the other stuff instead. They are attempting to gain the world, but they're losing their souls. And again, how often do we struggle with something like this today? 
I think God is calling us in this passage to wake up from the way that we so often pursue the right things in the wrong places. We have real needs, real things that we feel, I I need purpose, I need identity, I need truth, and I go looking for them in all the places that I'm not going to find them in the end. John Calvin commenting on this passage and specifically commenting on how often the word behold shows up in it, he says that, that God uses the word repeatedly because so great is the sluggishness of man that it is very difficult to arouse them. They do not feel their wants. Though they are hungry, nor, they, nor do they desire food, though they greatly need it. And therefore, their indifference must be shaken off by loud and incessant cries. I think that's what these first five verses are. God is calling us, in some ways pleading with us, challenging us to realize that we need meaning and purpose and identity and hope and joy and peace and all these other good things and that we can't look for them in the wrong places, that we'll never find them in our careers, our families, our sexuality, our hobbies, our politics, our activism, our morality, or any other earthly thing. Those are all good and helpful gifts that God has given us, but God says we cannot go looking after any of those other things because they will not pay the price for what we really need in life. We, there's only one place we can go where the price has already been paid and where we can find all of our needs. And so now the passage turns the corner into asking, okay, if this opportunity is real, if God is really holding out to me the chance to receive everything that I need without price, how do I grab onto that? How do I seize that opportunity? How do I grab a hold of it? So let's read verses 6 and 7 uh, about seeking what we are looking for. We already found it, now we're seeking it. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God has already showed us in the previous verses that there is no way for us to earn the things that we think we need in life. That is only an accepting an offer to receive them without price, to be given them as a gift that we find the things that really satisfy in life. Uh, as Christians, we, we point to this as kind of the core message of the Bible. This is what we see, that God created us, that we mess up, we break things, that all of our problems, all of those needs that we feel that are unfulfilled are unfulfilled because at its root our relationship with God is broken. Our relationship with God is not the way it was supposed to be. That we find those needs in our relationship with Him, but that it's been broken by our sins, by our errors, by the things we do wrong. And that God knows that, knows that there's no way for us to pay that price and says, I will pay it for you. Jesus comes, He lives a perfect life that should earn Him that perfect, unbroken relationship with God And yet he takes our separation and death instead so that he can say, here's this perfect relationship with God. I'm giving it to you as a gift. And that's where we find it. It is in only after receiving this gift, this grace from God, that God then calls us to seek him. Because if you do it the other way around, then the gift from God isn't a gift anymore. We're earning it. We, we are given the gift of grace from God, and then he says, start seeking it. Not to earn it, but to live more and more in the way that I want you to, in the way that will actually bring you joy, peace, identity, hope, purpose, fulfillment, etc. And we see clearly in these verses how we're supposed to do that. The way to seek what we need, to receive it as a gift actively, is to admit that we need it and stop running after things that won't give us what we need long enough to reach out and receive it. 
as I was trying to think about what this looks like in real life, the best analogy I came up with is we're kind of like an over-sugared kid running around at their birthday party. Like, we're wired, we're crazy, we're running after every little thing that distracts us, every shiny, colorful this, that, and the other, and there's a gift sitting on the table. The gift has been given to us by someone who loves us. It has the most wonderful thing that we can imagine in it. They love us despite the fact that we occasionally chase around the pets and or guests like a tiny psychopath. Um, all we need to do is hold out our hands and receive it. But so often we're so busy racing around in our hyper busy culture, running after every single ambition and possibility and opportunity. And none of those things are bad. But if God is the thing we aren't remembering, if he's the thing getting forgotten in our sugar addled mind, we might be missing out on the one thing that's sitting there. It's waiting for us and it might give us what we actually need, but we're distracted by everything around us. Tr the trio in verse 7 gives us, in practical terms, a great picture of what repentance, the, the idea of turning around and seeking after the thing God's given us, what does that look like? It starts with turning away from evil. It ends with turning towards the Lord. And in the middle comes a change in our hearts and our minds. The way we look at the world shifts. And we all need this true repentance. Because if you only, let's, can you leave that for a second? Because if you only have forsaking wickedness, but you're not turning towards God or really changing, that, that's, um, oh, excuse me, that, that's usually what we would call, you know, self-focused change. I can change in life. It just has to cost me enough, uh, that, that, or excuse me, doing the wrong thing has to cost me enough that I want to turn away from it. If I change, but I'm not turning away from wickedness or turning towards the Lord, that's pointless. There, whatever. It's, it's one of those shifts that doesn't really change anything in my life. And if I look at God, I love God. Yeah, I want to turn towards God, but I'm not turning away from evil. I'm not changing. That's what we call hypocrisy. And the Bible warns against that just as much as it does staying with the evil in the first place. We need this kind of change in our lives. And looking at this change should remind us uh, in a lot of ways about the, the, the need. It should remind us that while we need to acknowledge as Christians that the gift comes from God, that even the strength to lift our limbs, to lift our hands to receive the gift is a gift from Him, God has given us a role to play in receiving the gift. There is something that we need to do. And the sad reality is that some of us will run around the party for eternity without ever receiving the gift. One theologian wrote about this passage. He said, no one needs to be an outsider, but neither will anyone be forced to enter. And the invitation to do so will not be extended indefinitely. See that in verse 7, seek the Lord while he may be found. We don't like talking about the limited amount of time that we have in this life. None of us likes thinking about death, but it comes quickly and pretty much universally. And I think that acknowledging that fact, really forcing ourselves to see our limited time in the world and the necessity of accepting the gracious gift of God in Jesus, changes our perspective in life. And this is where it gets interesting because we already found what, what we need. And then God taught us about how do we start seeking what we need. But in fact, here, when we start seeking, it might make us reconsider whether we were looking for the right things in the first place. So let's turn to verses eight and nine with that thought in mind. Was I looking for the right things? But my, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. Uh, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. This, this isn't God showing off here. It's God trying to teach us something important for our own spiritual health. There's a beautiful line from the Valley of Vision. It's a Puritan, book of Puritan prayers. And, and, uh, and the, the prayer in particular is about how we should feel and what we should be, believe when our prayers are refused by God. When God says no, the line says, I have longed for Egypt and have been given a wilderness. 
When the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness after being released from slavery in Egypt, they began to grumble and complain about the hardships of their journey. They began to daydream and then openly complain about the lack of good things in their life that they were experiencing in the wilderness, lacking fine food and drink and so on and so forth. And, and, and we have to ask ourselves here, were the Israelites really deprived in the wilderness? Okay, maybe that's not exactly the right question, because yes, there were things they didn't have. The better question, I'm going to actually ask for an answer here. Okay, you, you ready for, for an audible answer? Uh, were the Israelites worse off the, in the wilderness than in slavery in Egypt? Yes or no? No, I totally agree. Yeah, you're all very wise and smart in getting to that conclusion. Um, no. They had been freed from literal captivity and slavery, and they were en route to a home, a land of their own where, that would be miraculously delivered to them by the same God who had miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt. But it felt worse. It felt worse because it was different, because it was change. They had become accustomed to the bonds of Egypt, and the freedom of the wilderness felt intimidating and strange to them. And I think in verses 8 and 9, God commands the Israelites, he implores us to not make the same mistake. To not, in our limited human perspective, look at our lives and say, if God is not giving me X, Y, Z, whatever it is today, then he doesn't care about me. The gift, like the cake, is a lie. God urges us, he's telling us here, don't believe that. Don't believe that the gift is a lie, that the gift is fake just because you're not getting what you expected to get. He urges us to consider whether our desires, like so much else in our lives, are thrown off slightly by the effect of sin around us and in us. In other words, maybe our desire for Egypt, metaphorical Egypt, easy things in life, comfortable things in life, not having to work, not having to worry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe our desire for those things while reflecting some of the good things that God does want to give us, maybe those desires were never quite right in the first place. Maybe we should have been hoping and longing for, praying for, growing in Christ, knowing him more, glorifying him in all things, bringing his light into the lives of the people around us, even if it meant going into the wilderness. Because that's what Jesus did. There's this whole theme throughout the Gospels of Jesus going out into the wilderness. And so often he's going out to intercede, and he's going out to intercede for us. He goes out to pray. Uh, and we know from other places in Scripture that often what Jesus prayed for was us. And in Hebrews 13, we are urged to echo Jesus when it commands us to go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. Jesus went into the wilderness, the, the hard things in life. The wilderness represented hardship and trial and suffering and temptation and so on and so forth. He went out into it, not for it, not to celebrate it, not to be like, I love pain and suffering and being sad in life. It's the best. No, he went out into it because he had the divine perspective that we are hoping to grow in. The Bible says that he went for the hope that was set before him. At the beginning of our passage this morning, we were focused on our physical needs and our most obvious felt needs. But as we wind to the end of the passage here, we're challenged to see that there's more than this. There's much more. We're challenged to grow and change in our hearts and our minds and our perspectives on life. And as we do that, we're promised that there is another layer to the gift. The bag had a false bottom. And there's more to be found within the gift. T.S. Eliot once wrote, We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And so it is with our passage and our message today. We began by finding what we were looking for. We find it in God. And only then did we begin to seek it. Great, magnificent reminder that finding what we need in life is not first and foremost about being smart enough, good enough, strong enough, moral enough to find God because God has already found us. He's already come and sought us. And it's in response to his giving us what we need without cost because he already paid the price on the cross in his son 
It's only in response to that that we begin to seek Him. But then we learn in our passage that as we begin to seek Him, we realize that our desires are often disordered right from the start. In seeking Him, we're called to reorder our lives, to relearn our loves, to find who God has made us to be in Him. Then that often that, in order to do that, we need to get outside of the pressures of the world, the, the traumas and, re, and mistakes of our past, the shame and guilt that so often holds us back in life. And in realigning our view of the world with his, it's only then that we return to where we started, that we find what we were looking for and we get a whole new picture on it. So in verses 10 to 13, we're going to see what is this new picture. Let's start with 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from the earth and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. We, we can find what we're looking for because God gave us a guide. He, he knew that we wouldn't find it on our own. And he said, I'm going to give you what you need to find what you're looking for. I'm going to give you my word. I'm going to reveal to you who I am and who you're supposed to be and how you've been broken by yourself and by the world around you and how you can be healed and how you can be restored. And God promises us that when we let it, his word will accomplish its purpose. Through the work of the Holy Spirit changing our minds and our hearts, it will give us new perspective on our surroundings, whether we're in a time of life that is Egypt or the wilderness. And it will help us to see them clearly and wholly. And he'll, be, he'll make us able to pass along this good news, this new perspective to others. Because what does it say there in mess? When my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall accomplish that which I purpose. How does God's word go out these days? Yes, sometimes he still spreads it supernaturally, but usually it's through human intermediaries that God delivers his word. It's through us. This is evangelism that we're seeing here. This is us taking the good news, the changed perspective that we find in Jesus and taking it out into the world around us, into our relationships, our families, our friends, our, our schools, our workplaces, our wherever it is that God has called you specifically in life. You're carrying that good news with you. And that good news, that word, that promise that hope that the passage says we get to share with the world is amazing. Let's read verses 12 and 13 for one more beautiful vision of what God gives us. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And, shall, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Joy and peace and so much of both that the very hills and forests explode with it as creation is reordered and healed and made to be what it was meant to be from the start. And it's all done to bring glory to God through our good. That's what we see when we open the gift that God has given us. We find that our lives today and our lives for eternity were meant to be, designed to be, in fact, our hearts are longing to be about bringing glory to God by enjoying Him and the infinite other good gifts that He has given us. That is, uh, was what the, our reading from Revelation this morning promised us. It's promised us an, etern an eternity where our lives are reshaped, where our perspectives are realigned with God, where we can find joy and peace, where the briars, the, where it says in there in verse 13 that the thorns and the briars become cypress and myrtle, those are evergreen trees. It's talking about eternity, that the hurt, the pain, the brokenness, the world transforms into an eternity the way it was designed to be, for the, be from the beginning. Exploration and joy and peace forever and ever 
Amen.